Hi, Olivia here, and welcome to Quantum Business Insights, where each week we explore new perspectives on the changing nature of business with thought leaders from around the world, and with a special emphasis on what I feel is our most valuable asset, our human capital. Today, we'll be exploring how to create a culture of innovation with my guest, Mitch Ditkoff. Mitch is founder and president of Idea Champions, a management consulting and training company that specializes in helping organizations originate breakthrough products and services and establish dynamic, sustainable cultures of innovation. In 2010 and 2011, Mitch was voted the number one innovation blogger in the world and is now a regular contributor to Huffington Post. He's, his widely read blog, The Heart of Innovation, is a daily destination for global audiences of movers and shakers. Mitch, welcome to Quantum Business Insights. So, you're welcome. Um, in your blog, The Heart of Innovation, which if you're interested as listeners, it's at ideachampions.com. But in your blog, you had a recent post in which you said, quote, corporate initiatives that fail to awaken the human instinct to innovate are doomed, no matter how many pep talks, tote bags, and T-shirts proliferate. Yeah. So, and you went on to say you need passion, the kind of passion that's present in, present in most startups, but as large corporations tend to squash it. So if we're in a large corporation, what can we do to awaken the passion to innovate? Well, uh, there's a lot that can be done, and um, uh, I want to preface whatever I'm going to say is that there is no a magic pill. Uh, but that being said, uh, awakening the passion in people has a lot to do with people, A, understanding what the vision is, what is collectively trying to be created, and that's one thing. So, like, what's the big picture here? What are we going for? And number two, am I enrolled? Am I on board? Uh, often, senior leaders in big companies, when they get uh, religion or they get psyched or somehow in, uh, innovation becomes the uh, – the initiative of the year or the flavor of the month, they get all hot and bothered and start uh, trying to pump people up, psych people up, and get them uh, cooking on, on all burners when people, as they hear the requests from senior leaders, uh, have a tendency to retract, contract, and basically go, you know, what does this have to do with me? In fact, I have no time to, quote, unquote, innovate. I can barely, you know, uh, do what's on my plate. So, Mm. You, you've got to find a way to, A, you know, uh, clarify the vision, and B, communicate that in a way that's authentic to people. And then, you know, once that's established, uh, you know, provide people. And here's the, the other X factor is most people these days, if you were going to uh, name the, the beast or the, 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 the obstacle in most people's work life, it's they have too much to do and mm -hmm. not enough time. And 95 or 99 percent of people who work, at least in corporate America or even in small businesses or startups, will say the same thing. We are maxed out. We're like running to stay in place. And then here comes, uh, you know, uh, inspired senior leaders, assuming they are, claiming, you know, that this is the year of innovation or we're going to innovate or we have a new innovation process. And when people hear it, their eyes, you know, their eyes roll in the back of their head. It's like, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? So, you know, it's got to be very, very, it can't be uh, uh, communicated as if, like, there are the commandments from, you know, on high. It has mm -hmm. to be done in a very real, authentic way. And that really depends on, you know, lots of variables in, in the way in which uh, company A, B, or C is wired. So... Uh, it's got to get real, and it's got to be the other piece is that people have to intrinsically, internally, individually feel the need and the desire. You cannot legislate innovation. It, it's, it's rejected uh, if it comes in from that kind of a legislated place. People are not going to take on a project that is imbued with lots of trial and error and lots of frustration and lots of... Uh, fits and starts and lots of obstacles, you know, the effort to innovate anywhere is, is a challenging thing than to innovate in a large organization that has lots of 
dysfunction and misalignment makes it even more difficult. So, A, you need a senior leader who, who, who owns this big time, not just as a flavor of the month. And that senior leader's team, the senior officers, they have to be aligned, and often they're not. So you can yeah. have a team of people, one of whom is all, you know, you know, gung ho, and the others are going, you know, this too shall pass. And then the mm. people down the food chain, so to speak, see the misalignment of senior leaders, and they go, "Well, those guys don't have their act together. I'm not on board." But let's assume that they 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 are uh, on board, and they are aligned, and they're authentic, and they they have a. a, a a long, you know, long view of things. This is not going to be an overnight uh, phenomenon. That's the beginning. But uh, even that uh, requires a a fair amount of clarity and effort that is often not there. So that's a long-winded way of responding to your question. (laughs) No, that's great, because it seems like then it really the basis is, is good leadership. Right. Um, well, or, it, or the right. Piece, I mean, the right kind of leadership. It's a piece of it. It's a piece yeah. of it. But but here's the 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 shadow, mm-hmm. and there is a shadow in all of this. Good leadership. Uh, you can have good leaders in many different dimensions. They can be good right. at. Uh, you know, uh, rewards and incentives. They could be good at working with stakeholders. They could be good at being committed, and they could be terrible in regard to fostering a culture of innovation. So have so you worked with a company where, or do you have any examples of where you went in and the leaders were hungry, but they yeah. had to make a lot of changes themselves? Absolutely. And, yes, so I what have kind, a lot of what, examples of that. And, and the one I'll give you that's the most traumatic and, uh, and I would say the most successful is a company in southern New Jersey called Atlanticare. They're a uh, health care provider. They have, what, 5,000 employees or so in a number of clinics and hospitals, nursing homes, and so forth. They decided some years ago they wanted to win the Baldrige Award, which is, uh, you know, this big uh, audacious award given to high-performing companies. And the uh, mm. winners of Fly Down to Washington meet the president. Wow. It's a very big deal of, of an honor uh, of how well-structured and well-run the company is. So they, they applied for it, and they didn't get it. And when they, when they looked at the application, in, uh, you know, as they filled out the application, there were 26 references to innovation, as in, what are you guys doing to be innovative? Wow. Um, 20, 26 <laughs> times they were asked the question in different ways, and 26 times they came up, blank like oops i guess not much <laughs> so the good news is instead of uh just bailing out they they got serious about what can we do to actually you know cross that t and dot that i in a noble way and so they contacted uh idea champions that's my company and mm-hmm. said help we need to we need to raise the bar for innovation, and we really don't have a clue. Or we have a clue, but that's all we have. <laughs> so anyway, we went in there for 18 months, worked with them in different ways. Again, mm. different ways. They decided to establish what they called an innovation council, which was a nice step forward, which was to get uh, different stakeholders from different parts of the company in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> what At a concept! The same time, oh my God, that's uh, what a, what a breakthrough! Yeah. And begin to become a a high performing team. Listen to each other, you know, talk to each other, brainstorm with each other, and get <clears throat> an overall vision and a strategy of what the heck this even means. If if I say to you, Olivia, you know, innovate a, a culture of innovation, that's a little bit could easily be like apple pie, motherhood, and democracy. What does it mean? Yeah. So everyone interprets it differently. So their first step was to get you know this sort of ecumenical council together of mm-hmm. people. And, and even that, by the way, because lots of companies have so-called innovation councils, where they call them different things, and they're, they're uh, dysfunctional. 
The, yeah, the, I would think people skills would be so critical here. So how do you get them to actually listen and trust each other? Well, that's what the first part of the process with them. Actually, the first part was that the the CEO and 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 his team said yes to you know we want to dig in here and we know it's going to take some work. So you have our support, which oh, required good. a budget and required some time, time and money. So that being done, uh, a, a person was designated and or stepped up to be the, uh, I forget what they called her, the director of innovation or the innovation champion, which is key, you know, for mm-hmm. somebody to say, the buck stops with me, I'm paying attention, uh, my eye is on the ball, you know. And yeah. then uh, I worked with her uh, to help form this innovation council. And yes, uh, you know, it, it, it required a commitment that not everyone had. So some people dropped out very quickly. They went, mm-hmm. whoa, this is like a second job, or I didn't sign up for this. So they don't pay was me it, enough. Uh, was was it mostly because of the be time it took, or was it asking other things? Yeah, So, but but things sorted out, and the right people ended up there. And then, you know, we met... Uh, uh, I, I met three months in a row with them, and then after we got that established, which, like the formation of any team, has to do with agreements, commitments, role clarity, getting a, a, a common vision of what their charter was. Actually, they wrote a charter for their mission as the Innovation Council, uh, right. along with whatever kind of dissolving of boundaries and, and kind of old paradigms that they had or judgments they had about each other. Um, yeah. uh, but but that, got, that got established. They got serious. And then, you know, I was able to, uh, not, you know, kind of hand off that role to the client. And then I just stayed in touch with them via phone and some conference calls. And then we worked with other pockets of people. We got uh, in that organization, I think, about 10 people trained to be, uh, I think we call them innovation ninjas, which mm-hmm. were to be uh, people who, in, in the course of their daily life on the job, could be uh, activators or catalysts for a certain kind of thinking, willingness to challenge a status quo, run meetings completely different, differently, be able to facilitate brainstorming sessions with disparate groups. So, you know, there were a number of things that we did with them. Uh, they had some large-scale town, you know, you might call them town meetings, hundreds of people in the room. Mm. Uh, and basically, uh, they applied again for the Walters Award. They didn't get it. And then they applied a third time, and guess what? They got it. Wow. Which was a what very a validation. Big, you know, acknowledgement of the effort that they made. But it, 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 uh, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah, it it's, uh, it really requires a rigor that, in my experience, few organizations have. Yeah, and I think because because of the work I've done in in leadership development and training, I see so much of it is really around personal growth in many ways. That that people that get on these teams and are expected to participate and show up and respect others and trust others, it takes a a lot of internal work. Is that something you notice? Oh, a thousand percent. And and I'm I'm kind of of uh, the uh, school that what you're saying is ninety nine percent of it. If if people <clears throat> are awake, if uh-huh. they're conscious, if they are um, out of their own way, that's at, at least half of it. Um, yeah. When the ego in, has to be kind of place, tempered. It, mm-hmm. Excuse me, I missed that last one, Olivia. Um, it has to be tempered, I guess. That's what I was saying. Well, the you know, there, there's there's two things. There's, you know, when, when when clients ask me, like, you know, what are the obstacles to innovation? And you can make a list of a thousand, but ultimately they all boil down to two. Oh, my God, this is getting simple. What could it possibly be? Well, the <laughs> easiest thing to talk about are the external things. So that would be, oh, you know, we have uh, ridiculous workloads or communication channels in our company suck. We don't have an intranet. Uh, the senior team is misaligned. We don't have a rewards and recognition program. 
our performance reviews are ridiculous, and uh, we just went through a merger and acquisition, and no one likes each, anybody here. Okay, <laughs> yeah. got it. Mm -hmm. So that's normal. The other one <laughs> is <laughs> internal. You know, that's what I just described was external. That's the stuff in the system, mm -hmm. like the government. Oh, my God. You know, the, the internal thing is each individual, each person, like, and their strengths, and mm -hmm. then, of course, their own constraints, which are fear of failure, fear of looking bad, uh, procrastination, self-doubt, um, you know, not being disciplined or organized. You mm -hmm. can't blame the company for that. You can't blame your boss for that. That's your own stuff. And well, so, do you ever work with companies that actually hire people that are going to have the qualities that would facilitate a culture well, of innovation? Well, you know what? There are some companies that actually get it, and they have their uh, new hire process is very sophisticated, and they actually have ways of being able to identify uh, you know, certain attributes, indicators of mindset that, mm -hmm. that are in favor of or aligned to the likelihood of that person being an innovator you know, on the job. Or at least and a good team player, don't. right? Mm -hmm. At least a good team player. Well, yeah, that they at least could, a good uh, team player. Fuel somebody yeah. else to be innovative, if, if nothing else, right? That's right. So, yeah. yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It all starts with the, the hiring process, and there are some some companies that are aware of that and have it wired in such a way that they're bringing in people that are actually potential innovators and team players, as you said, and there are others whose hiring process is kind of crow magnon mm, Great. Thank you. Well, so we're just about up on a break, and so I think this is a good time. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the kind of personalities and maybe uh, how that reflects on the leadership. So what I wanted to follow up with uh, right now is, okay, let's just say we, we have this great team and they're very high functioning. What if there's a threat to someone on the leadership team? So yeah. what are the qualities of a leader that have to also work here? Okay, this is such, that's an awesome question. And if Thank we could you. bell this cat or bottle it, uh, <laughs> Things would change radically everywhere. And <clears throat> I'm going to give a response that I hope isn't too simplistic, but it's certainly a piece of the puzzle. One of the reasons why, quote-unquote, innovation doesn't happen all that much or it's so sluggish and painful for it to happen is because leaders or people in power, people that control budgets, people that manage other people, uh, have a tendency to default to, you know, what's traditionally called command and control, which mm -hmm. is like, I'm in charge and you're not, and uh, I'm smart and you're not, or I know better than you do, or I don't really trust you, even though I, I'm pretending to trust you, but when it comes right down to it, I'm going to withhold support and withhold the budgets and make it basically hellish for you to succeed because fun fundamentally, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that what you're doing is going to work. So that's like, um, that's the worst case scenario. Obviously, it's not the whole case, but in some leaders, quote unquote leaders, that's what they're thinking. The other thing that's sort of the, the shadow side of this is that innovation, you know, as Tom Peters once said, uh, is a very messy business. It's not clean. It's not like a reductionist, follow the dots, little strategic plan, do one, then two, then three, then three A. It takes a lot of trial and error. There are a lot of fits and starts. There are quote-unquote failures. There are detours. There's the whole kind of bee's nest of ego and personality and interdepartmental squabbling and hmm. you know, co competing for resources and all the messy stuff that goes on in the background. So when senior leaders start to get that, quote, unquote, innovation is afoot, uh, there are more demands on them than ever before. There are more people asking them questions. They're being asked to release monies. They're, they're asked to go to more meetings. They have to listen to more pitches. And, you know, that makes them cranky. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, that's, that's, that's the dark side of it. And then I think... Uh, 
probably a lot of leaders or managers don't really get the level of commitment that they are going to need to make to step up. And, and, and here's what often happens. So, like, I get invited out into different companies to run a variety of creative thinking sessions or visioning sessions or brainstorming sessions. They, everyone has a different word for it. And out of those sessions, great ideas come to, into being you know, start to emerge and they get developed and and people get excited and little, you know, ad hoc teams form and it's like, oh boy, we're on our way. Then you run into the fact that, you know, it's the eight pounds and the four pound bag syndrome. How are these people in this room going to have the time to develop, refine, execute, follow up on all this good stuff that happened here today when they are maxed with their so-called day job. And right. that's where uh, they and senior leaders have to look at, uh, you know, reallocating resources, as in, you know what, your job is going to change. I'm going to give you 20% more time, and I'm taking this off the table. I'm going to give you two more people to assist you or whatever, you know, that, mm -hmm. that requires some moving and grooving, and often that's where things get stuck. So in your experience, have you ever seen a big innovation project uh, or momentum uh, uh, succeed where they haven't done that? Or is it almost like essential that people be given that extra well, I, time? Well, I think everything... Every possible uh, variation happens. The, the, there, mm -hmm. there, are, there are companies who, who are, you know, kind of bull their way through and, and get to the end, end line, mm -hmm. uh, but they leave a trail of, of, of uh, wounded people, mm -hmm. uh, dissatisfied people, cranky people, people quit. And then there are companies who, on the front end, understand that this is innovation is a very human dynamic and they front load it on the on, on the front end to be mindful of the interactions uh, between and among people and also mm -hmm. start to refine internal systems if you will uh, so that they're more user-friendly or human scale and responsive mm -hmm. but again uh, 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 here's here's the other thing Lots of companies decide that they, uh, they need a quote-unquote innovation process. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get a process as if that was enough. It's never enough because here's the other weird thing. Uh, research has been uh, done by a company called the Desai Corporation some years ago, and they discovered that 75% of all big, hairy innovations, product innovations, service innovations, big, juicy, you know, projects that have seen the light of day, 75% of those were the result of serendipity and accident. Oh, yeah. Okay, not part of a strategic plan, not the outcome of a brainstorming session, but, uh, you know, if you look at vulcanized rubber, the Post-it note, Velcro, Viagra, um, <laughs> you know, right. uh, penicillin, all those things were actually the result of a of an accident or a surprise in the lab at, at, or you know the environment in which uh, most people saw it and wanted to dis dismiss it as a as a boo boo and somebody got curious about the way in which things were behaving differently than they expected and they didn't just toss out the baby with the bathwater or the you know, the, the fungus with the Petri dish, you know, mm -hmm. and got interested. So how do you, you know, how do you integrate that phenomenon into a company trying to create an innovation process, which often leaves no room for the unexpected? Yeah, I wonder how, I'm just sort of curious how many good ideas do go past and never get picked up because of that well, culture. Well, I'd say most. And I don't have any data on this, but I'd say, you know, people see what they're primed to see. Yeah, that's There's a basically great, quantum uh, physics, uh, right? Anybody who's listening, go watch this uh, very cool YouTube video called the, uh, called the uh, what's it called? Uh, the Selective Attention Test. Hmm. And it was uh, some research done by some, co 
some psychologists. I don't want to spill the beans on it, but mm-hmm. you'll find it if you if you Google selective attention test, and you'll see the power of what we perceive is a function of what we're ready to see. Right, like and doesn't it, that tie in with quantum physics and how we attract everything. what we're yeah. thinking about, which is sort of the basis for my show, is that there's this whole different way of of looking at the world. Absolutely. And, and you know, we talk we, about yeah. people, get, well, just real quick, um, you yeah, know, people ahead. say when they, they got a car and then the next day they noticed how many other people had the same car. So that kind of fits that. You know, exactly. You know, the, the, the classic little uh, uh, meme is when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are pockets. Mm. Because that's how the frame or the mindset of the pickpocket is. Uh, If you're hungry and you're driving through a town, you notice the restaurants. If you're running low on gas, you notice the gas stations. If someone's dying in your family, you notice the funeral homes. Mm -hmm. You never saw how many funeral homes there were until your mom was sick. Right. So imagine in a corporation or an organization, it doesn't have to be a corporation, any group of people that's got people living in different worlds with different frames, if you will, different perceptual filters, seeing the same outside thing differently. So, of course, the marketing guy sees everything as a marketing problem. The IT guy sees everything as a techno problem. And the CFO sees sees everything as a budgeting and cash flow problem. Yes. (laughs) In fact, it's so fascinating because I worked for a credit card bank back in the 90s, and they were really smart. They actually traded the chief risk officer with the chief marketing officer and vice versa. Beautiful. And yeah, it was just amazing because, of course, they that's one of the biggest problems in most financial institutions or credit institutions is this battle between them. So they had the perspective from the other side, and it was really, well, you, really you know the Look, I'm married. <laughs> and you know that John Gray book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus. Right. So uh, you have the two genders. Then you have the 12 astrological signs. Mm. If you subscribe to the Enneagram, you've got nine different styles of relating to life. Mm. Um, you've got uh, different generations from boomers to millennials to, you know, whatever the, the latest and the greatest uh, divisions of, of the demographics are. You've got... Mm. Within a company, you've got all these subcultures, you know, depending on the job and the function. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you put all that in the, in, in, in the stew, and it's like, okay, this is like 10-dimensional chess. But yeah. That, that being said, I want to put that all aside because it makes it sound hopeless. It's not hopeless. If you have a, a core group, and I don't, you know, that's to be determined what that means, of committed people on fire with possibility, totally focused, and not into the blame game or the bitching and moaning or making people wrong, but they see a possibility and they are committed to getting to the end game, that that itself, you know, look at what Mahatma Gandhi did, one guy, mm-hmm. okay, or Martin Luther King. So in a way, it only takes one person who is totally in the zone, that starts to ripple out. People feel it. They get a mm-hmm. contact high. They get enrolled in the, the wisdom and the power and the, and, the, and the passion. You mentioned the word passion in the beginning of the call. Mm-hmm. And that starts, everyone wants to feel that way. Most people don't. But if mm-hmm. you have a few of those people that are cooking, and then you have senior leaders, let's put it, the, you know, if they're senior leaders who recognize that in their organization, they have a few of these people that are out of the box, and they are an amazing resource. If they can find a way to leverage these people, at the very least, to get out of their way and, and do what they can to support them, innovation will be the likely outcome of that um, in whatever way in which it happens. So do you think companies like Apple and Google just have these cultures that maybe grew from the beginning with uh, inspired leaders and and people that got excited about just how successful they were? Well, it depends on who you talk to. I mean, you know, the (laughs) thing about 
Apple. Everyone holds Apple up as the poster child for innovation, and oh my God, look what the, look what they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in uh, my local cafe here in Woodstock, New York, the other day, and like it seemed like every person in that room had an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, everybody's got the same phone in their pocket. Okay, uh, well, you know, Steve Jobs, genius, madman, you know. Over the over the edge of like incredible you know mind and passion, and left a trail of devastation behind him. A lot of people, you know, didn't like Steve Jobs. Hmm. And you go, was he a good manager? Most people would say no. Was he a brilliant innovator? People would say absolutely. So, you know, Google, you know, they they do a lot of things right, uh, and those cultures are held up as as the uh, avant garde of of the model. But when I bring those examples to my clients, people you know fold their arms and raise their eyes, and they go, "Look, we're an insurance company. Mm-hmm. We're not. We don't have any Steve Jobs around here. <laughs> we're not. Google has so much money they can throw at things. Also, we don't have that much money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things those companies have done. One of the things that Google did, which I loved, and I think they've stopped doing. They, along with 3M and some other companies, uh, gave their uh, engineers, a lot of their programmers and kind of their wizards, 20% of their time to basically follow their passion, do whatever they wanted to do, even if it wasn't in the job description. And Mm -hmm. at one point, 50% of what you see on the Google homepage, all those cool products like Google Earth and and Gmail and, and Google Maps and so forth, those products were birthed during the 20% of the so-called downtime that Google gave its engineers to just sort of like mess around with whatever they were fascinated by. Well, and that speaks to this uh, idea that I think everyone has experienced, which is where, let's say you're struggling with a problem and you're really just fighting it. My, in my experience, and I know many others have shared this, I'll go for a walk or I'll take a nap or I'll be in the shower and the solution will come. And it's because it's been able to go over into the right brain, you know, kind of bump around where patterns are recognized and things are synthesized. Yeah. So I'm imagining that's what's happening with these engineers. I mean, that just sounds brilliant. But again, it's it if, to, from a manager's perspective, it might feel wasteful when, in fact, it's probably well, you, one of the best investments of time, right? You know, absolutely. A thousand percent. 10,000%. I've asked 10,000 people where and when they get their best ideas. It's a little hobby of mine. Sometimes <laughs> I do it one-on-one. Sometimes I do it with hundreds of people at a time. Less than 2% say they get their best ideas at work. Mm, yes. They will say in the shower, commuting to and from work, work, walking the dog, exercising, and so forth. Mozart used to get his best ideas uh, late at night between midnight and nine and right after he exercised. Einstein, he was famous for having said, why is it I always get my best ideas while shaving? Interesting. So what happens, in the, and, and psychologists and social scientists have studied this phenomenon, and your instinct, Olivia, is totally spot on. Uh, it's been uh, proven to be true again and again and again. The conscious mind uh, takes on a challenge or a problem and goes, i got to figure this out, or this is important to me, or I want to do this thing. Then it, it does everything it can, you know, rigorously, purposely, to, to make it happen, and it hits a wall, invariably. Mm-hmm. Now, if you hit a wall, as most people do, the subconscious mind takes over. That's the innate internal problem-solver genius that's latent, and that often will figure it out while you're sleeping, late at night, early in the morning, during the, what the psychologists call the hypnogogic or the hypnopompic state. And that's a fancy way of saying when the logical, analytical, linear, rational mind that most business, businesses run on, that's mm-hmm. their gas, that's their petroleum, when that stuff is at bay, the softer, fuzzier, more etheric, mystical, you know, not logical stuff, we have access to and that's often where the genius comes from but companies if you just think about a day in the life are all spent basically in spreadsheet meeting analysis data which is all left brain stuff right yeah and which (laughs) really ultimately doesn't get you the answer unless you 
give up thinking in some ways. We actually solve problems many times when we're not conscious of it. We'll be struggling and then perhaps give up and go for a walk or take a nap and the solution comes and how we need to really pull access our non-conscious mind, which we can't really control, but that the thoughts and uh, problems will kind of go in there and bump around and then come out with a solution. And so, Mitch, I wanted to go back. You have a blog on October 29th on your Idea Champions a blog, uh, The Heart of Innovation, where you talk about brainstorming versus brain calming. And brainstorming is something that everybody talks about as a process of innovation or a, a tactic to get good ideas. But it sounds like what we were just talking about was brain calming. So I just wanted you to maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I run a lot of brainstorming sessions and have since 1987 uh, with wow. all kinds of companies as different as MTV is from uh, Pricewaterhouse or whatever, GE, and most people, you know, in those uh, brainstorming meetings are uh, uh, jacked up in some way, <laughs> if that's the expression, caffeinated, um, sugared out, uh, sleep deprived and compensating for it, uh, stressed and, and just trying to move quickly. Wow. So. You know, there's a lot of uh, sound and fury. There's, a, and again, I'm exaggerating this to make a point. There's a lot of speed, um, and you know, from that state of mind, you know, there's a lot of ideas there. There's a, you know, it can be even insights too. But it, sometimes it feels like hydroplaning. It's just like uh, a little, a little too, too much. And uh, what, what's not often happening, uh, certainly in a brainstorming session and rarely in, during the course of a day, are times to quiet down, <laughs> slow down. Right. And just like we, we noted earlier in the call that some of the insights and breakthroughs happen to people during uh, down moments, in a, uh, incubation time, you know, the reflective time where you, you're, you're – your brain is processing things offline and then making sense and synthesizing things, that's because it's quiet. That's why right upon waking, right before sleep, even in the middle of a dream, there's some quiet thing going on. That's why people like to meditate or do yoga or go for a walk. You know, uh, Socrates used to take his students out for walks while he taught them, and that was called the peripatetic school because he knew that nature was a great activator or catalyst for, you know, a, a, a deeper dive into, into what he was trying to get at with the students. So when I, I talk about brain calming, I'm just saying that there are times in a meeting, a conference, or even a brainstorming session where you can do an activity that honors the fact that uh, there's a deeper place to go and a deeper source of creativity and I ideas than just the caffeinated brainstorming mode. And wouldn't it be cool if people were able to integrate those kinds of exercises into a brainstorming session? And, and sometimes I do. <laughs> so uh, just food for thought for people to consider. That's interesting. So I missed a little bit about what you were saying. I'm not sure if it was missed on the recording, but I I really find that fascinating because especially when you're talking about walking in nature, I actually remembered hearing about some scientist who went to an art gallery over the weekend. He was struggling to find the formula for the uh, some compound that he wanted to create. I think it was some sort of a, a drug that he was working on. And he looked at a a painting and and while he was staring at the painting, the formula showed up or the yeah. the right molecule connections that he he could see to use it. So it was uh it was pretty cool. And I also when you were saying about Gandhi and Einstein and Mozart, I remember hearing that Thomas Edison when he was coming up with ideas for the light bulb would actually sit and 
when he would get stuck, he would sit in a chair and he would hold marbles in his hand or a, a, I've heard different stories, a plate of ball bearings or something yes. and, and take a nap. And then as soon as yeah. he was in a deep enough sleep, it would yes. fall and wake him up and then he'd have another idea. Have you heard and, that? And, and not just Edison. You know who else did that? Salvador Dali. Oh, really? Both of them, because they realized that lots of their good ideas came right upon waking after they had been consciously struggling with some uh, challenge or problem, and they, they uh, like good innovators and geniuses that they were, they say, why should I only wake up once a day? <laughs> I mean, that's the concept, right? You wake up right. once a day, but why not wake up five times a day if, upon waking, you have access to a greater level or source of inspiration or ideas or solutions. So they took naps during the day. <laughs> And, uh, but, but more than taking naps, and here's the other piece, Olivia, lots of us are getting clues from the subconscious. Few of us are actually remembering. Oh, so how do we get better at remembering? Well, there's a lot of ways to get better at remembering. You know, people that subscribe to the phenomenon of lucid dreaming, Mm -hmm. or its second cousin, which is just remembering your mundane dream, before they go to bed at night, they actually give themselves a little uh, suggestion, and they say, uh, remember your dream when you wake up in the morning. They actually will tell that to themselves. And when they wake mm -hmm. up, before they do anything, go to the bathroom, brush their teeth, you know, drink coffee, they will actually wake up and jot down the images, the 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 impressions or, or the arc of the dream in a little journal. Because if you don't do that right away, a mm -hmm. minute later it's gone, like, like smoke right. or like vapor. So, um, you know, that's being mindful. And, and by the way, uh, there's a fancy uh, a phenomenon, which uh, you will not be tested on, by the way, when I give you this little phrase. It's called <laughs> blind variation selective retention. And that is a phrase that describes the phenomenon that within our brain or our mind, uh, it's like a hard disk that's spinning. And it's spinning so fast, it doesn't even seem to be spinning. It seems to be still, but actually it's moving quickly. Buddha, as it's been said, I didn't talk to him directly, but I've heard this, said that there are 2,000 thoughts every second he had slowed his mind down enough to be able to tell you what the last two were. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, you got that phenomena where there's good stuff happening, but it's happening like on an ultraviolet level, on, a, on an octave. Dogs can hear things we can't hear. And right. what, what these psychologists or, you know, brain researchers are saying is that, there's all kinds of good stuff going on in your mind, but it, you're not paying attention. <laughs> well, so that's fascinating because one of the things that I do sometimes if I am trying to make a decision, a, maybe a major decision, I'll say, all right, sh you know, just universe or whatever, show me a sign yeah. by the end of the day and make it so clear that I have no doubt that it's telling me what I should or shouldn't do. Um, so maybe that's kind of part of that. It's it just, is. It's about setting an intention. And it's about being, uh, you talked about brain calming, it's being still enough, quiet enough to be able to recognize what's showing up. In, in the examples of those great inventions, the penicillin, vulcanized rubber, the post-it, etc., Viagra, LSD, they were all accidents. Somebody was actually paying attention uh, and, and noticed those where a lot of people didn't notice them. And if you want to yeah. get all spiritual uh, for a moment, think about all the great teachers that have come on planet Earth with Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, whomever. And some people recognize these folks and go, oh, my God, there's a great teacher among us. And other people went, uh, that dude should get a haircut. Yeah, that's and get true. A job. It's so like, it's, Wait a minute. You know who you're talking to? <laughs> but they didn't, they, they, their mind was so busy full of their own preconceived notions. They couldn't really see what was right in front of them. Or, yeah, or they didn't have any inkling of them that 
was really seeking that maybe yep. that's in the a prime, way. that's the 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 that place where we talked about earlier about being primed so right. they weren't really open they were just basically going with their routine and you know that's all they get and some people go through a whole life like that yeah that's true and it's funny so i shared this before on the show on a prior show that as a kid i was really add and um didn't so I had a hard time concentrating to read, but math came easily. So I studied math. And then when I got into being an analyst, got a degree in statistics, and of course developed reading skills and um, coping mechanisms because I love reading now, but sometimes I still have to watch The Wandering Mind. Um, but I was working for a company and they said, well, we have our analytic types and our creative types. And I thought, well, what do you mean? I'm, I think of myself as very creative and then really made a place – a name for myself in the data mining world by coming up with creative ways to use statistical models to build predictive models for companies that outperformed anything they had just because I was sort of creative. So mm. um, I think everybody probably has some ability there and maybe some of the things we talked about, like focusing yeah. on what it is you want to attract or, or slowing the mind or all these things could help people. Well, you know, yes, and I think it comes down to a fundamental question, which, uh, you know, is really a universal question for everybody, no matter what they do, where they live, you know, what they practice is, um, who am I and uh, how can I contribute? You know, what can I do to serve? How can I help? Mm. What's well, my work? A... What's my, not my job, what's my work? Yeah, let's, let's and, really work in this world. And some people, uh, you know, live and breathe that stuff twenty four seven. And some people say, you know, oh, you're dreaming. You just need a job. I want to support my family. All right, it's not a perfect job, but you know, you know, grow up and join the real world. And they concede to kind of a lower level destiny for themselves. And then, along with that, there's a fair amount of resignation and and aggression and, and stress, all of which uh, subvert creativity. Wow. So their, their gift of creativity doesn't really surface because it's covered over with a lot of uh, crapola. Right. Well, we're just about out of time, so I really want to thank you. I, I think the question you ask, who am I? I remember working with a, a shaman one time who said, answer these four questions for yourself. Who, who am I? Why am I here? Yeah. Where am I going? And what do I need to do? And, there you, go. Um, you know, <laughs> I sat with those. So thank you. I just so appreciate you being on my show and I hope you come back and visit us again. I'd love to. And thank you for, you know, creating this opportunity for me to share a little bit with you and the rest of the folks on the call. It's great. Thanks. All right. So next next week, I'll be exploring the question, what is spiritual intelligence and why is it essential for leaders today? And my guest is going to be Cindy Wigglesworth, author of SQ21, The 21 Skills of Spiritual Intelligence. And this book came out on Amazon the first day it premiered at number one in business and spirituality at the same time. It's a truly wonderful book. So we'll be talking about that sure to join us next week. I'm your host, Olivia Parrud, saying thank you for tuning in to Quantum Business Insights. Have a great week. 